coming on episode two of book talk today uh we'll be discussing the book what game are you playing by rob moriarty and i am joined by the author thanks very much and uh and yeah one thing i actually wanted to start off the the conversation with asking is you've gone to so many countries what country has the best bookshops oh the best bookshelf yeah great question um, well, first, thank you for thank you for having me, and that's an awesome first question. Um, wow! So, <laughs> I, like three or four have just popped into my head. Okay. There's one in Uruguay, which is actually one of my favorite countries, um, but it's in this old house, okay. and so it's like an old antique house with really high ceilings and wood walls and things like that, and they just have books stacked on all the shelves, on all the walls, and then tables. Oh, and I love God. that one because it's the mix of like Portuguese and English and Spanish books. And they have like a lot of art books and a lot of books about music and musicians um, and just sort of that mishmash antique get mm. lost in a bookstore kind of thing. Mm. Um, and then I guess in Portugal, there's like the oldest bookstore in uh in Portugal, which I love because it's like hundreds of years old and you can kind of feel the hundreds of years old. Buenos Aires has one that's in an old theater and that one's really So you go in and it's like the foyer of a theater, the opening, and then you go into a place where it's the whole round theater that they've converted into a bookstore with cafe and little tables to sit at. And then probably like Tokyo, just because okay space in Tokyo, but just like you see books that you're never going to see anywhere else, you know, mm. Portugal, Uruguay, London's got a few wonderful bookstores, of course, yeah. um, but you see books and titles and pictures and drawings and you don't understand any of it because I don't speak Japanese and, and I love that. I love just sort of that, that feel that happens when you get inside a bookstore, mm. adventure and discovery and like stuff you didn't even know existed yeah just going through the going through the uh going through the shelves and finding things that you didn't even know were ever written and uh, i was talking talking about this with someone actually a couple of uh, days ago is the idea that you walk in and you it's, it's it's in the air it's like tangible it's like a feeling that you get as soon as you walk in it's uh it's amazing and uh yeah i, I can't wait to, to to visit those places and and hopefully see those uh see those bookstores so thank you for your answer um that, that one kind of stuck in my mind as soon as I read that, because that was in the introduction where you kind of, you talked about, you know, going off the grid and stuff and, and doing that. And I kind of thought to my mind, just like, where are those really good bookshops that you've, uh, that you've gone to? So um, yeah, in the, the, the book is essentially about defining what success means to you and, and finding that for yourself. And what was the, what was the main inspiration um obviously me reading the book i i, I know the inspiration for, um, for yourself because you know you you lay out your story within the book it's for for those who haven't read it yet what was your main inspiration for writing the book so so there's sort of the the shallow inspiration for the book and then there's the deep learning that goes up so i'm going to share the shallow part first and then i'll go into the deep learning part um so literally one day as as life sort of has these serendipitous opportunities that, that present themselves. One day I'm sitting in my office, just regular afternoon, four o'clock, having a coffee, ticky ticky on the emails, just having a normal afternoon. And my best work friend came into my office and it's this really large man. And he was ranting and raving and screaming and yelling and kind of mad about something. And he was that guy's winning and we're losing and I can't believe he's winning and why are we losing? And I'm just sitting at my, at my computer and I stop and I pause and I look at him and I go, okay, Paul, like what's, what's going on? What are you talking about? And he's like, that guy's winning. And it was the day that our CEO's executive compensation had been announced, which was mm. a very large number of you know, amount of money, yep. way more than he was earning, way more than I was earning, of course. And he was mad that we were losing mm. and that other guy was winning. And so I paused and I looked up at him and I said, I don't know what you're talking about because I'm winning. Mm. Froze. And he looked at me. <laughs> He's like, what are you talking about? Because he knows I'm not making more money than the CEO is making. Yeah. And I said, well, I'm not playing the game of who's making the most amount of money. Mm -hmm. I'm playing the game of who gets to spend the most amount of time in the coolest places around the world. Mm. And I'm winning. 
And I pointed to the calendar on my wall, you know, like one of those dry erase marker calendars. And it shows like where I travel all year. And it had, you know, Shanghai and Delhi and Ho Chi Minh and Santiago and Istanbul and London and all these wonderful places. And I was like, that's my scoreboard. That's my version of winning. And he stopped and he looked at me and he goes, that's brilliant. You should write a book. And so like, oh, wow. Like, okay. Oh, who's the book? You know? But when I started thinking about it, I was like, that was one of those like serendipitous moments that mm. kind of push you into something. But when I started thinking about it, I was like, wow, you know, that whole idea that most people define winning or define success or define a good life and what a life is supposed you know, a good life is supposed to look like, we're sort of trained and conditioned to think about that. And there's so many other ways to live your life. Mm. And I think that because I've, I've lived on four continents, I've traveled to more than 60 countries, I have definitely had all of my American cultural conditioning kind of shaken out of me <laughs> because of the experiences living in other places. And so I can see that in a different way that maybe some other people can't. And I realized that that whole perspective of I don't have to define success the way other people define success. I don't have to look at those milestones in terms of education, relationships, jobs, houses, kids, whatever. I don't have to look at those the same way other people do. I can take the opportunity to define my own version of success and live my own version of success. And I've seen so many other people around the world living their versions of success that I know that it's possible. Right. Yeah. So I think that journey part was what really got me understanding that the way you want to define a successful life for yourself doesn't have to be the way everyone else has told you to. Mm. And that was kind of what's underneath and underlying the book. Yeah, that, that definitely makes itself known when you read the book. The fact that that underlying factor um, of how do you want to define it for yourself and then basically creating a framework for you to do that and you know the obstacles that you you're going to overcome and, and plans to deal with that it's interesting that you mentioned the perspective thing when traveling from different countries and experiencing different cultures do you think travel is a necessary part of the self-awareness that comes from um, learning from different perspectives because in my personal experience traveling does so much for you not only for your ability to you know find out what you actually like and dislike and, and finding out about yourself, but it's also engaging in other cultures, embracing yourself in other cultures, which gives you a completely different perspective that you weren't aware of before. And, you know, I, I always say to people who don't travel, it's like, just go places and, and see how different people live. Cause you get a different perspective. Was that the case for you when you've been to so many cu uh, countries and cultures that, that definitely probably changes your perspective, doesn't it? It does. And I, you know, I, I was really fortunate. Okay. So I grew up in this really, really small town where nobody had passports and people didn't really travel. Mm -hmm. And when I was 11, I was fortunate enough to be able to travel with my family to Germany. And that was really unusual and especially at the time and whatever. Yeah. And um, I remember being 11 and I remember having to eat food that wasn't the kind of food that I usually eat. Yeah. <laughs> First, you know, hearing different languages and public transportation, which was a big deal that we didn't have in my little town, and, you know, just things like that. And I remember just this, this um, imagination that got sparked and this realization that not that the world is really big and people live very differently. And I want to be a part of that. And so I think very, at a very early age, I kind of had that drive and that understanding that there's a lot out there and a lot to learn mm. from other places and that it's really cool not to say that what your country is bad or whatever but it, it's that that contrast between what's normal for you and what's normal for someone else and that's where like possibility emerges right mm. and so for me travel has always been kind of a part of that when i see other people i think travel accelerates that learning because if you go to a culture that's really different from your own, um, you're forced immediately, you know, like people who go to Latin cultures and dinner is really late at night and mm -hmm. you're starting at six o'clock and you have to adjust. I mean, mm -hmm. so small, but such a big deal, you know, or you go to places that have, um, you know, I remember the first time I was in um, Egypt 
and you have the call to prayer. Yeah. And that was totally unusual for me. And I had never experienced that before. And I was like, oh, but that's kind of cool because it's a moment, you know, several times during the day that you can sort of pause and reflect and, and sort of structure um, your day. And it just, it, so you just start seeing that there are different things that people can do, different rhythms that you can experience and you start finding the joy in those. And then you get to decide which ones work for you, which ones don't work for you and which ones you want to sort of incorporate back into your daily life. Mm. Um, and so I think travel accelerates that. I think you can do that if you sort of expose yourself, you know, read, mm. go to different parts of your town or travel more locally or just interact with people who are just fundamentally different from mm. you. But nothing accelerates it and emphasizes it the way travel. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Um, if people can't, then yeah, definitely trying to seek help people who are different from you is definitely a great way to do that. In in the beginning of the book, you talked about how um, authors encouraged you to kind of like go off the grid, you know, go to like ashrams, like go out or like away from your problems. And I know in the book, you referenced the fact that that's just not helpful advice because you have to live your life in a way. What were some of those books? Because I, I was interested. Um, were they like sort of the Eckhart Tolle kind of books or were they more like Deepak Chopra, that, that kind of essence of book? Right. Rumi. Uh, yeah. So Eckhart Tolle, um, Deepak, Deepak Chopra, but then um, Eat, Pray, Love. A lot of people have called me and said, Eat, Pray, Love is the story of your life. And I kind of get annoyed. I'm like, no, that's the story of someone else's life. Thank you for <laughs> on to me who you think I am, but that's yeah. not really what someone else is. But yeah. there were few of those that were like go find the silence meditate um was it throw those kinds of those mm. kinds of books. what i found for myself and there was a time when i was very much into like yoga and meditation and visualization and all these other kinds of things but i realized what for me it was actually like trying to control and hold some things in as opposed to like releasing some stuff that needed to be released and like that I needed to get into a phase of acceptance about. And so I think for me, when I look at those different kinds of books, I think the moment that you're in kind of impacts what you get out of those books. Mm. And if they be helpful in pushing you forward, or if they actually kind of hold you back into your status quo, right? And I, I have a book on um, a book that is like a psychology book that has been sitting on my shelf for like six or eight months. And the other day it literally like fell forward on the bookshelf. <laughs> I was like, yeah. oh, that must be I need to read right now, <laughs> you know? And so I kind of, I kind of believe that the books that you need to read kind of hit you in the moment that you need to read them mm. and read them too soon. Like it's not the right time, yeah. you know? So sort of, they'll sort of make themselves known as you're on your journey that's so true actually i've i've had i say that to to my followers all the time and a lot of them say that to me is especially when they um so we've, we've started to do a book club every every saturday and and one of the gentlemen who's come on he's new into reading and he was saying to me he was like it's almost as if the books are choosing me and you know i feel like that's the case sometimes is you like you're saying you have a book that's on your shelf eight nine months you don't you don't even think about it and then next thing you know it kind of just it just presents itself and you're like, this is the right book to read at the right time. And funnily enough, I actually felt that reading your book as well at the same time, because in it, you say how, like when you traveled to, you know, a different country and you wanted to change jobs, you're about 27. I'm currently 27. And I feel like it's quite a pivotal age at times because you've been working for, let's say six, six years or so straight out of university. And you're kind of thinking about, is this what I want? Is this not what I want? And you've got that, that, that stage. And for you, what were your feelings when you were going through that? And, and how did you deal with that sort of pivot or, or, or sort of pivotal moment in, in, in redirecting yourself? Yeah, not well. <laughs> would be a short <laughs> um, so I, I um, thank you for sharing that. That's really, that's really interesting. So at that moment in my life, I basically was making a massive career shift. And I had, I had gone to university. I already mentioned I was already interested in um, international things. And I, had gone, I, I graduated from university in the middle of a recession. So usually what you do is keep going to school, right, <laughs> if you can. So I was in a PhD program and I was on like the track to work at a university and be a professor and do all that kind of stuff. And I 
just knew it was not going to be right. And I was projecting and seeing what my life was going to be like. And it was going to be a lot of the same forever. And it wasn't going to have that amount of adventure mm -hmm. and learning and growth that I really need to feel alive and good and, and you know, growing as a human. And so I did, I call it the Cortez strategy. So there was one of the Spanish explorers that landed in Florida and they burned all the ships. So you couldn't turn back around. <laughs> you had to make it work. Now, okay. I don't recommend this strategy for yeah. everyone, but I kind of did a Cortez thing where it's like burn all the ships, burn all the bridges, burn all of the past to force myself to go forward. And it was because I didn't know any other way to like make myself embrace a change. And I knew I was gonna end up so comfortable that I was gonna miss my life. And so, um, and so I kind of quit the university job, didn't look for any other university job, started looking for um, corporate jobs because I knew that there was a lot of travel involved with corporate and started and, you know, had, Poor, I mean, literally cried two or three times a day for three or four months until I got a job. Um, but eventually something worked out that was a better situation for me and that set me on a different course for growth. Mm. Since then, when I've had other pivotal moments in my life, I've been a little less drastic. And what I've done, fortunately, um, and what I've done is I realize, and I, I kind of think about it as like tectonic plates and earthquakes, right? And sort of, um, I'm not an earthquake scientist, <laughs> but sort of, I kind of feel like I can feel the shifts going on under the surface in my own life and mm. in myself before anyone else sees the earthquake and the big change. And so I've gotten more in tune with those sort of shifts of my own internal tectonic plates. And when they start happening, I go, okay, well, there's a change that's going to come right and so i need to be getting prepared for that sort of mentally and emotionally and also i need to be getting the support around me to be able instead of the cortez strategy mm -hmm. you know to be able to support me through that change and that's been probably the biggest learning is finding the right kinds of support which are not always the people who you supported you in a who supported you in a previous phase because the kind of support you need like right now or in a current phase may or may not be the kind of support you need in a future phase. Mm -hmm. And so it's like going out and finding that different kind of support when I can feel that some sort of change is about to occur. Sure. But I've, never, I've gotten very good at like before I would try to suppress the change. I don't think you can suppress it. It's growth. It's like when you walk on the sidewalk and you see the tree roots busting through the concrete because mm -hmm. that tree grow. You know, instead of suppressing the change, just be like, I've got to grow and I've got to bust that happen. Do you feel that requires a lot of self-awareness though? Like you talk about the idea in the book about, you know, self-awareness is key, especially spending the time and, and effort to truly understand, you know, the game that you want to play and, and the person that you want to become. And I think that's really important. The thing you talked about, the purpose, the person that you want to become, you know, you, you can't change that, especially if growth is going to happen. But at the same time, it requires a lot of self-awareness for someone to, to, to come to that understanding and, and to know themselves when they're going through those, like what practices did you use? Were there certain, um, were there certain books, were there certain ideas that came along that helped supplement that when, when you were going through it? For sure. For sure. And so, and I, I, I think you're always on the journey towards self-awareness. I don't mm. know if you ever become totally self-aware or maybe mm. as soon as you do, stuff starts changing again. <laughs> yeah, no. Nah. It does. It does. But I, I, th I do think there is a, there is a, a base, if, if that makes sense. I think once you start going and, and becoming more self-aware, then you can develop on it. But I think some people definitely do struggle with the understanding of it in, in the first place. For sure. So for, and I'll, I'll be, I'll be really honest. Um, for me, a lot of it came through therapy because I had you know, moments where my life came crashing down and I had some you know, sort of traumatic experiences that happened in different phases. And I realized at one very low moment of my life, like I've got to figure some stuff out or like, I'm not going to be on this planet for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And so I think that for me, going through therapy was a big part of it. So what about therapy was it? 
it was, and it, this goes back to sort of the book and the cultural conditioning piece. I realized through therapy and through some different books and things that, that I was reading at the time, there's one called The Body Keeps the Score. Um, there's another one about trauma and the tiger, but I can't remember the name of it right now. Uh, but there, there were a few other books that made me realize um, cultural conditioning in general and just, you know, sort of the culture map by Aaron Meyer and Geert Hofstede sort of traditional cultural anthropology kinds of books. But they really made me realize how programmed I had been to live my life a certain way and that that was what was causing so much blockage to my own self-awareness. And so one exercise that, that I did one day, um, they said, you know, when you see something that, that clashes with you, there are usually two thoughts that come into your head. The first thought is the thing that you've been taught and to think. And the second thought is what you actually think. So just as a real simple example that they used, um, and this is gonna help enlighten the sort of religious Christianity that I was raised in. <laughs> You're not supposed to wear short skirts or any clothes that are super revealing in the background that I was raised in, right? And so, and so the first time, like when you have this clash of like seeing a woman who's dressed in like a mini skirt or like sort of a low cut top or whatever, the first thing that pops in my head is, um, you know, what a hussy, what a, what a fat person, right? Um, and then the second thought is good for her for having the courage to wear what she wants to wear, right? So it was like that first instinct of yeah. someone else's voice in my head. And then the second thing is my own voice. And it took me a long time. And then since then, I've had experiences with those kinds of thoughts and comments a lot. Um, but it took me a long time to realize that sometimes the voices in my own head weren't even my own voices. They were like that stuff that I'd been trained about. And I had to sort of um, realize that to be able to push that off, to be able to hear my own voice. And that's when my self-awareness journey started. It was when instead of hearing, you have to make straight A's, I didn't make straight A's on a failure. Oh, wait, no, I'm not a failure. I'm just good at math and bad at English. Like, okay, fine. You know, or, um, you know, you have to get into a good university, you know. Oh, I didn't get into a good university. What's wrong with me? No, it's, it's just that wasn't the thing that was going to happen, you know. So it, it's, it's hearing your own voice instead of those judgmental and critical voices, which are usually not your own voice, but the voices that have been, that you have been trained to listen to. So that, I think, if people can kind of grasp that, then you can get on that journey to self-awareness. Mm -hmm. But until you grasp that, I think becoming self-aware is difficult because you're listening to someone else's voice instead of your own. Yeah, I think that's the central tenet of your book, isn't it? It's the idea that is the things that you want, are they from cultural conditioning? Are they from what's been conditioned from you from school or from, you know, what society's expectations of you are, which I think is so critical because at the moment I feel like there is a, you know, you, you talked about in the book about the idea that financial success is is the main sort of barometer for for success in, in the US. And I would consider it the same in, in the UK. Um, I wouldn't say it's to the same degree uh, that it is, um, I think. And, but I also think it depends on the culture that you're in. Like, for instance, you've probably seen it when you've traveled to different countries, like some cultures heavily emphasize you know family over over financial reward or, or the ability to be within your community and uh and foster relationships within that and, and and grow the community so i think it definitely does depend on your culture and and what that that determines and any religious um, associations that you have within that culture as well i think that's that's really critical and it's interesting that you said about the idea that you have to understand that first thought and that second thought I think that's, that's, I've always almost think that's like the emotional brain. And then that's like the, the critical thought brain. It's like, okay, is that what I'm actually thinking or is that what I'm not, not what I'm thinking? So that is a really interesting point that you make, especially because I think that's, I think people act on that first one. And when you can sort of separate yourself and I, I like the idea of treating yourself um, as if you're responsible for treating it's a rule in 12 rules for life by Jordan Peterson. It's the idea that you take yourself out of your individual self and you look, your, look at yourself as like a third party because you also, you always care for someone better than you care for yourself. 
so try and take yourself out of that and, and do that so um yeah that's that's really important um in the book especially you talk about the idea of like designing a new game for yourself like and if someone's in a particular job or the particular the career that they're not enjoying like like you were um or, or on a path how would you suggest the best way to design your own game i think now it's easy it's more easy than ever with the internet and and, and the ways that barriers are being broken down how would you suggest that someone for instance who who might be listening to this is is wanting to you know redefine their career or, or start a new career how would you suggest going about starting that yeah yeah and i think that i think that's really important and i think um you know the first the first question i think to ask yourself is you know what is the role of your career in your bigger life picture and your bigger life game right and so for some people and for moments in my life my career was everything right all of my other decisions revolved around my career other people I know, their kids are everything. And all of their other decisions revolve around their kids. Yep. You know, other people, it's, you know, aging parents that they need to take, up, take care of right now. So I think, you know, is your career the thing that you want everything else to revolve around? Or is your career an important part of this more complete picture, right? And so I think that's really important because I think understanding you know, if your career is what you're going to revolve your life around, if it's where you're going to seek fulfillment, or if it's the thing you're just going to go and do for a bunch of hours a day and it's going to pay the bills so that you can then go do some other stuff that you like, right? So, so I think that, you know, understanding what, what a career means to you. In the U.S. culture, career is supposed to be where you're getting fulfillment, financial reward, even friendships you know, sort of self-actualization almost. We really think our jobs are very important. In other cultures, it's not that way. You know, a job can just be a job and it's the thing you do. So you can go do something else after work, right? So, so I think that's first of all important. Then I think it's going through and really under, so the purpose of work in your life and career in your life. And then I think it's going through and really understanding um, what are the kinds of environments and kinds of things that you do that bring some of that enjoyment? I don't think anyone should ever be in a toxic work environment, but um, you know, it's funny, like I have some quite introverted tendencies. And so there are certain kinds of jobs that exhaust me <laughs> that I just don't want to do, you know? Um, and so, you know, understanding like, those parts of your personality of what kinds of jobs are going to bring you more energy as opposed to jobs that are kind of taking energy away from you mm -hmm. because if the job is bringing you more energy then you are going to be able to go do other things but if it's taking away from you then it's going to be it's going to be a problem so for me i think about purpose and i think about energy and then i think about you know sort of what is it actually are you really into design or technology or something like that so, so thinking about purpose and energy first, and then thinking about content. I think most people ship, ship, um, jump to content first without thinking of the role of work in their life and the energy of the environment you want to be working in. Mm -hmm. But if you've gotten to the point where you're thinking about content, you know, that's where I, that's where I think that you start um, having a lot of fun deciding what kind of environment you can express that in and how do you want to, how do you want to work? Um, and do you want to work for someone else or do you want to work for yourself? And, you know, what are the pros and cons of that? But first, it's about purpose and energy before you get to content. Yeah, I, I, I definitely agree with you, I think, because that purpose maps out the future for you. Like, like I always say to people is if they want to get into reading or, or they want to um, they're trying to map out goals or something. And, and there was a, a great line. And I think it was Atomic Habits by James Clear, where he talks about the idea of try and redefine your value structure and who you actually see yourself as um, rather than the goal itself. Like for instance, if you want to become, you know, uh, more athletic, see yourself as an athlete. Don't just say, Oh, I want to start running, you know, once every couple of days, it's no, I'm an athlete or I'm a healthy person. It's that, it's that change in mindset, isn't it? To, to define the person that you want to become. If we just take a step back actually, because there was a question I wanted to ask you re regarding the, the therapy aspect, because in the book you talked about in Argentina, was it correct? That it's sort of embedded in the culture for people to go and see therapists. Was that correct? 
Yeah. And, and, and for me, it was really interesting to read that because I personally subscribed to the thinking that I thought I read, I read that and I thought, I think a lot of issues, this is a broad statement, a lot of issues could be resolved or diminished if that was a less culturally taboo thing or socially taboo thing to go and see a therapist because it's just essentially talking and a lot of things can come out of the come out of the woodwork when just talking arises um, but some people don't feel comfortable with doing that with the people around them but if they find a third party then they feel that so what was your experience with that going from somewhere perhaps in america where it's a bit more taboo to a place where everyone goes and sees one yeah so it was it was it was kind of shocking because um, therapy in the U.S. mindset is where you go when things are really bad mm. and you go for a few weeks to fix a specific problem, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, that's like, that's what it's for. And if someone's in therapy, like, it's like a big deal, mm. right? Um, and so I think some of that is changing, but, but not, not enough. And so then I went to Argentina and I mean, I had, I had just gone through a divorce. I was living in a different country. I had started a new job. I didn't really speak Spanish and I was just, I was losing it. I mean, I was just sort of a wreck emotionally, mentally, physically. I was, a, I was a wreck and um, everybody kept talking about, oh, I've got therapy. Oh, I can't go to the meeting. I have therapy or, oh, I'll meet you after therapy or we'll get dinner after therapy. And I was just like, well, this is just interesting. And I started reading and it turns out they have like the highest per capita number of psychologists in the world or something oh, like that. Okay. Everyone has a therapist. It's covered by your health insurance. It's fine. Um, and I started realizing that um, having someone to talk to who doesn't really know you and doesn't put the judgment and the criticism and you don't censor yourself because they're not part of your social circle or, or your world, that lets you be honest with yourself in a way that, uh, that talking with a friend or talking with a family member might not let you be. And so for, for me, what, what therapy really opened up was this space to be honest with myself about good and bad and you know the gray and all of the other stuff that, that goes on in your head without sort of censoring myself because I was worried about how the other person was going to perceive me, right? Exactly, yeah. so I, think, I think so much of it is, you know, the way we judge other people. And then sometimes we forget they're judging us right back. Right? Mm, yeah. Immediately. <laughs> if, you can, if you can kind of get into a space where that judgment and that criticism isn't there, you can start saying the stuff that you weren't allowed to say before and you can start getting honest with yourself in ways that you weren't before. And then what I found is as soon as I could start getting honest with myself, I could actually start getting honest with other people in, in more ways, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you think about relationships, if you can't really be honest with yourself, it's really hard to be in an honest relationship with someone else, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and so kind of, going through that process of having that very safe space of without judgment and without criticism was helpful. And then, you know, once you get honest with yourself, then you can start to say, here's what I would like to be better at. Here's how I would like to be a kinder person or a more self-compassionate person or a whatever kind of person you want to be and so but once you have that space you can open up that honesty that then leads to other kinds of growth how long did that take <laughs> like i think it's still happening <laughs> 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 uh, yeah, so, to be real to be real honest yeah um, i know i know it's i know it's a journey but it's more the fact of how how okay how long till it felt comfortable to be in that environment yeah, yeah. so um so and i i find that there's a bit of like stop and start you know like you go and you're like whoa that's a lot i need to take like a year off <laughs> just absorb all the stuff that came out and just breathe a little bit and then like maybe yeah. you all come back to some of it again right um so i probably started therapy i don't know 10 or 12 years ago now i i'm sure maybe longer, um, but sort of 
sort of six months at a time, you know, or um, once a week for three months, because that's really intense. Mm. And then like once a month for a year, you know, um, or take two or three years off and then come back to it. It's sort of that thing of the book that falls off of the shelf, right? Like, like every now and then I go, oh yeah, I probably need to go back and work through some of that because things are layered like an onion, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think for me, kind of the getting honest with myself and getting comfortable and like being trusting enough that there's a space without judgment and criticism probably took like a good six months, you know, so probably like 12 sessions or something like that to kind of say, okay, like they're not going to throw this back in my face. <laughs> like this is, I can just let it out and, and see where, see where things go from there. Have you been, um, have you been recommending it to others? Sorry to interrupt, but have, have you been recommending it to other people if you've seen them going through stuff? Yeah. I have, and I have, I have one therapist, um, you know, my therapist too, I think it's really, I've been working together for probably six years now. So like the same therapist for six years and there's just a stream of emails. Hi, Jessica, I'd like to introduce you to so-and-so. <laughs> Hi, Jessica, I'd like to introduce you to so-and-so. But I think that's the way that it works, right? And you know, when you're honest enough to say, hey, I've been through a lot of like really rough stuff in life and I've gotten through it and I've gotten through it with different kinds of support, including therapy. And here's the person that's helped me. People automatically go, can you send me the name of your therapist? I'm like, yeah, of course, you know? But I think that, um, that you've got to see it as here's my safe, it's not, I've got to go fix my head. It's yeah. here's my safe space to get really honest with myself yeah. and say some stuff out loud. And then the rest of it, you know, the therapist is sort of accompanying you on your journey, mm. but you're leading your journey. Mm. So they're just there to make sure you keep going. <laughs> yeah. You stay on track. Yeah. I almost think, I almost think it would be a lot better in, in our societies if they, if it wasn't as taboo. And I, I think we'll eventually get to that stage. You know, you see a lot, a lot of the things, I don't know whether it's in the U S but in the UK and especially they have like online things like apps where you can like speak to therapists and people, you know, not in person, but like over the phone, you know? And, uh, I think, I think it would contribute to a lot more people being self-aware and having that understanding about where they want to go in life, if they're able to, you know, talk about things in a, in a safe space, because I think culturally as well, in some cultures, it's very taboo um, right. to, to and, go see someone and, and talk about these things. Yeah. And I think some of it, you know, when I look stiff upper lip in the UK and I think mm. about self-reliance in the U S there's sort of this perception of weakness. Yeah. Um, if you are not, having a good time and there's weakness in depending on other people and those are two very ingrained values in those two cultures but you go to other cultures that are more sort of group oriented so you know living in in east asia living in hong kong and china um, you see a lot more group oriented latin american mediterranean cultures tend to be you know more group oriented and you realize that like depending on other people is kind of cool <laughs> you know? it's kind of nice yeah. instead of having to only depend on yourself all the time depending on yourself it's kind of exhausting mm -hmm. and if you're only taking care of yourself you don't really have the resources and the energy to be taking care of other people but if you're all sort of taking care of each other, it works in a very different way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I have so many friends from, from Europe and from the US who love going to Latin America. They fall in love with Colombia or Brazil or Argentina. They fall in love with Italy or Spain. You know, they fall in love with cultures that have that kind of, you know, all taking care of each other. And it's mm -hmm. messy, it's complicated, but it's human and it's emotionally fulfilling. Yeah. And, and so the cultures that are more self-reliance, don't depend, stiff upper lip, suck it in, you know, I think that's what people from those cultures enjoy about traveling to the other cultures. Yeah. Yeah. They just see like a group of people that in the street having, having dinner or something and they're like, oh, okay, that's what people do. Okay, cool. That's, that's really interesting. Or, you know, they help each other out a lot more than here. I feel like it's, it just doesn't happen here as much as, as other countries, you know, that, that community, that community support group. 
world I think. Can watch it all, right? Like, oh, well, if I do, if I ask them to help me with this, they're going to ask me to help them with something else. Yeah. It's this transactional thing instead of this, hey, we're all just community and it all is just going to flow. Yeah, exactly. It'll all work out in the end kind of thing. And um, in relation to the book specifically, how was it, if we're going to go away from sort of the contents of the book, how was it writing? I'm assuming it is your first book. How was it writing the actual process? So I've written chapters in other people's books and more like academic writing. Sure. But this is definitely the first like book that I've ever written. Um, and I sat and kind of chewed on it in the back of my head for probably two years. Okay. Um, and then it just sort of spilled out very quickly over the course of four to six months. But that's kind of my process is like, I've got to work it all out in my head mm. and it's tectonic plates kind of thing. You know, like, <laughs> going on, and then when it's ready to happen, it happens really fast. Yeah. It happens quickly. And so for me, I sat on the idea for about two years and that's how long it took to kind of figure out the framework that's in the book. Uh, about making it around the game and the objective and, and the different obstacles and how you keep score and, and the, the different aspects. And once that framework gelled in my mind, the writing part went pretty quickly. Mm. Um, and so I had a first draft probably four to six months after, after I started writing. Um, and most of my writing was on airplanes, right? Because I mean, airplanes are wonderful. I almost feel like I want someone to buy me an airplane seat and just like buckle me in inside my house because I can get so much done. <laughs> it's, it's, in, it's interesting you say that because I remember reading a story from an uh, who, which book was, oh, I can't remember the book, but there was an author that did that. So what he did is in order to make the deadline, he basically bought a round trip. I think he did it to Japan and he basically flew to Japan on, on the airplane, basically turned around, 15 minute turnaround, and then flew back and then got his book finished. But he got it done because you're like, stop, yeah. what else? You so... So I did, I did that. Um, and then when I was looking with publishers, that was actually an interesting experience mm. um, because some of the publishers I talked to wanted to make it a lady book. You go girl, you know, kind of like, they were like, they said, men don't buy books written by women authors. And whenever anyone says you can't do this or you shouldn't do this okay. or you have to do this, I automatically just like lean back. And one of them said, well, you have to turn this into like a pink cover, a lady book, you go girl, put like all this like girl power stuff in there. And I was like, you haven't read this book yet, have you? Because the first thing it says is you don't have to do anything that everyone tells you you have to do. Yeah. You get to make choices about what you want to do. Mm. And so I finally found a publisher who was like, no, no, you're in charge of that. And they're like, you know, if you don't want to do that, um, then here are some other paths and here are some different ways to go. And so for me, that was also really enlightening. And it was enlightening to learn more about an industry that I don't know much about. I know more now, but that is really um, about the speaking, the blogs, the websites, the guru, and sort of turning you into like the personality or the guru that people follow. Mm. And I remember no, I like I wrote a book I think it's cool and you know I share I love sharing experiences and 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 talking with people but I don't think I'm a guru <laughs> <laughs> or a coach right. like, that, that gets floated around quite a bit at the moment I'm like yeah I I don't I don't think that's it you know and they're like but that's the formula for success and I was like okay again yeah. go back and read my book yeah, about yeah. have you actually read the book <laughs> <laughs> it's so interesting how, you know, you have an idea, you have something that you want to share with other people, you want to pick up a format to share it in. Mm. And then all these other people want to start pushing you in a way that may not be the way you want to go. Mm -hmm. And so if I had not written this book, and I had not been like, how do I define success for myself? I probably would have just gotten swept up in it because it's easier to just get swept up in what already is happening mm. than it is to go, no, here's what's right for me and here's how I want to handle this. Um, and, so, and so the process of writing happened pretty quickly and pretty easily. And then, um, and then the process of like, what do you do to make it successful was where I had a lot of real learnings. 
And then the one part about writing that was hard. So um, they, they hooked me up with an editor and I liked her very much. I thought she was pretty amazing. But she kept saying, you have to get more personal in this book. And I kept going, why? <laughs> and she said, people need to feel like they can connect with you. And I'm like, why? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a pretty guarded person, personally. Yeah. Um, and so she would, she would say that, and so I'd go away for the weekend, and then I'd like send her some notes, you know? And I would go back and think about it, and I'd send her a few more. But it was this very, it's a very humbling process to put yourself out there mm. and to talk about things that aren't your best moments and to talk about things that you've been judged and criticized for and to talk about your vulnerabilities in a, a, a public space. And so I think I gained a lot of appreciation for people who do that on a regular basis because it's brave. And then I think I also realized that since I've written this book, some of those most vulnerable parts that I shared are the parts that people have really connected with and said nice things about. Mm. And they were probably the things I was most worried people were going to say. <laughs> about. Okay. And, so, and so that to me was also sort of, you know, tons of gratitude for that, but also like a big learning experience about getting comfortable sharing stuff that's like painful or hard or sort of vulnerable for you sharing it as much as you're willing to share because mm. i didn't ever share um but you know i'm more comfortable now with sharing than i was before i wrote the book and then one other thing that's really fun sorry to just that's keep, right. going no, keep on going keep on going i think it's kind of funny so um when you're putting something out there that you've created and it's hard and it's vulnerable and you know it takes some courage yeah um and so i remember when i wrote the first draft i gave it to a few people that i know and love and trust a lot and i said only tell me good things tell me what you like about mm. this and then i heard things that people liked and that gave me a little bit of confidence and then I shared it with the, like a few other people that I know and love and trust. Tell me what you like. Tell me what you would like more of. Okay, now I'll share it with other people. Tell me what you think. Okay, now I'll share it with perfect strangers who don't know me and now. But it was after I had built up a reserve of like confidence and good mm. feeling about it that I was able to share it more broadly. Mm. And I know a lot of people who are like musicians and artists and they're like, I'm just going to put it out there and see what happens. I'm like, that's so unsafe, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? And so I think one of the other things is sort of learning how to say, okay, I can share this, but just a little bit in a certain way. And one of my friends who was sort of in that middle circle, I gave it to him, said, tell me what you like, tell me what you don't like or what you want more of or whatever. And I said, but, you know, be kind, right? Like, I only want to hear good stuff right now. And he said, well, I can't do that. I'm just going to have to tell you whatever I think. I can't just tell you the stuff that I like. And he goes, and I've made some people cry sometimes, you nope. know, giving that. Not good stuff. Not at all. Okay. No. So he gets on the airplane and turns his phone off. So he wakes up nine hours later and turns his phone back on. So you know those really long text messages that you send sometimes? Yeah. Like, they're like pages and you have to keep scrolling on your phone. <laughs> he woke up to one of those for me because he totally triggered me. And I was like, I'm over here being vulnerable with you and you're, you know, potentially going to send back something that's really painful for me. And I had gotten myself all defensive and ready to like, you know, fight about it. And yeah. it was, it, a funny experience because it was like when you're choosing that support and choosing who to share your work with especially if it's very personal and you're vulnerable you know make sure it's the people that you trust and who are going to hear you when you say i only want to hear good things mm. because that's them respecting you and that's you doing a good job of communicating your needs mm. But he got this really long text message and I still chuckle about it. We're friends, obviously. <laughs> but I was like, oh, remember that time I sent you that really long text message? <laughs> so. 
that's the importance I feel like of the team that you surround yourself with, I think, and the people that are around you that you trust, because, you know, the last thing you want to do if you're creating something and if you're creative in any other field, in any field, it doesn't matter, especially in, you know, in the, in, if you're creating something like a musician or, or, or a writer, the last thing you want to do is put your work out there and everyone just straight critiques it straight away. Cause you know, like you said, you're vulnerable. You're, you're putting your story out there in this one in particular, you're putting your personal story out there. The last thing you want is for people just to critique every single sentence and be like, Oh my God, you went through this, but you know, X, X, fill in the blanks when it comes to these things. But yeah, it's a really interesting story. And I think that will provide a lot of people value if they, if they're trying to go down the same road and, and, uh, and create something for themselves. Would you do it again? Yeah. And you know, it's really funny. So I had, um, so the, the first, the first book it's, you know, it's about cultural conditioning and it's about defining success for yourself. And I had like a second book kind of mapped out, but it was more about groups, like the community and like families and relationships and thinking about, you know, that cultural conditioning and how I was going to call it, I think I might still call it, like, it doesn't have to be this way or it doesn't have to be like this, you mm. know, like, like you can sort of interact in different ways. So start with the person and then go with the group. But since then, a couple of people have been like, have been like, can you write the book that like teaches you how to eject from your certain situation to be able to go into another situation? I thought, well, how interesting is that? That sort of that, how do you, how do you unravel what you're in to be able to reconstruct in a different way, especially when it involves, involves relationships or businesses or, or things like that. And then I've had a couple of other people say um, more on a societal level, which I think for me, it wouldn't get political, but I think they're thinking more like political societal level. Like mm -hmm. how do you rethink the social contracts? And so much of that comes from, cultural conditioning and core values and beliefs that you share together as a society. Yeah. Uh, but I think, you know, recent events have really shown that some of those are more helpful than others. Yeah. Um, and that there are times when a group of people needs to get together and kind of rethink that. So kind of like, I've got like a couple of different drafts and outlines spread out across my desk right now. Um, but something else will come up for sure. Um, yeah. And I would definitely do it again. It's been a really positive experience. That's great. And, and I think it's related to the, the thing we were talking about earlier with the books. I think that the right book will choose you at the right time on, on the one that you're going to, that you want to write. I think you'll just, it'll just be the one nagging in the back of your head, probably saying, no, this, I can't leave, leave this idea alone. So that's really interesting. And I, I can't wait to read the next one, whenever it comes out and uh, whatever it will be about. Um, last five minutes, I want to ask you, what are some of the books that have impacted you the most? There's so many. Okay, so the one that jumps to mind first, um, Khalil Gibran, The Prophet. Yep. So that book changed so much in my mind. Um, and the chapter about children on children. Mm -hmm. And he talks about they come through you, but they're not from you. And I don't have kids. Um, but that whole idea of your whole role is to help other people become who they're supposed to be as opposed to becoming who you want them to be or who you are or whatever. That, um, that concept has really stuck with me and has been very important. Um, other books that have impacted me a lot. Oh my gosh, there's so many. I should have made a list. <laughs> I need to go look at uh, That's why I wanted, I wanted to be off the top of your head though, because I think if you prep, like I get asked it all the time. Like I do a and a every Sunday and see people ask me what my favorite books are. And mine are determined on what my thoughts are at the particular moment. It changes based on what I'm thinking. So that's why I kind of wanted to just ask you fresh, just because to see, you know, whether it's a recent one or. There's another one by Mo Gaudat that's called Self for Happy that I loved. And I was just wandering around um, the subway underneath Hong Kong one day. And that one just jumped out at me. And I read the first two pages and I put it down because it was all I needed to read right then. And he has this concept that your default state is happy. Mm. And he's like, it's like your iPhone where the default state is fine, but then you put all these apps and all this other garbage on top of it and then it stops working. Yeah. <laughs> so the default state is happy. And that one like really got me through some different kinds of moments. Mm. Um, I, yeah, I really like, I really like that one a lot. And then, um, I've been reading like some fun, some fun books, um, this summer, which has been, just been good. Um, I read Hillbilly Elegy. There's a book called Educated that blew me away. 
uh, uh, mem- t- Tess, is it Tess something? Uh, I've seen that one across Instagram quite a bit, but I've heard really good things about it. That one blew me away. And mm. that, was, that one blew me away also. It, so it's a powerful personal story, but it's also that idea of um, being raised a certain way and then entering like a different world that doesn't work that way, mm. but you're sort of tied back. Hillbilly Elegy has a bit of that in it too. And so that's kind of a theme that I've been, I've been picking up on lately um, in some things that I've been reading. But those were some of them that, that jumped to my head just right off the top. Right at the top. Oh, interesting. I haven't, I haven't read, I mean, I've read The Prophet, but that was, that's been a couple of years ago. But apart from that, that's what I haven't heard. I haven't read the other ones. Um, it's interesting that you say the ones that are related to different cultures, because, you know, when I traveled to to China, especially, I, I did a, after my second year at university, I did a English teaching program thing. So I spent a couple of months teaching in a, in a school and you come across some books actually there. And going back to the thing we talked about it's the time and place when you read things and they kind of reframe your perspective when it comes to certain things and you just can just read a couple of lines even a paragraph or two and you're like that's just really powerful and there i read some confused some words from confucius and and some philosophy some chinese philosophy and it just completely changed my perspective on 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 things in in general and and i think that happens the more and more you read the more the more you come across things and perspectives that just completely alter your uh alter your perspective but um thank you so thank much you. for this this was a this was a great conversation and uh yeah the book is what game are you playing oh my god and i did all the drawings too which i'm super oh, did you <laughs> i oh. also did Drawings on airplane. So hold on, I'm gonna just hold up my self portrait because I'm actually like super proud of my incredible artistic skills. So talk about putting yourself out there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> anyway, I love that. So I'm I'm very proud of that, and I'm happy to be able to speak with you today. And thank you so much. Really appreciate you having me on. You're welcome. You're welcome. And I, I'm I'm looking forward to the next one. I'm looking forward to the next one. So uh, yes, thank you very much. And uh, hopefully speak to you soon. Great. Thank you.